The S1H has been a huge hit for Panasonic, namely because its image quality is much more similar to their cinema cameras like the Vericam than the GH5. And that's also one of the reasons why it was the very first mirrorless camera to be approved for Netflix productions. But this kind of technology does come at a price 5600 Canadian to be exact, and that puts it mostly just in the realm of the professional serious shooter. Well, the fix for this is Panasonic's brand new S5. The S5 sports many of the same attributes as the S1H, but at $2600 cheaper. And it's smaller and lighter than the GH5. Let's take a closer look at this remarkable new camera. There are two ways in which a camera brand can approach a new product. The first is obvious, which is just come up with something more innovative than anybody else, which is kind of what they did with the S1H. The second is when you take that technology, you take that innovation, and you make it accessible to people who are less demanding users. And that's what we have with the S5. All right, so here's a quick highlight reel of what to expect with this camera. The S5 delivers the same color science as the S1H and the Vericam, with 5.9K RAW coming in a future firmware. For compressed codecs, the 5S tops out at 4K 60p at 10-bit 422, and up to 180 frames per second in HD at 8-bit 420. The S5, like the S1H, has a dual base ISO. Now, the actual ISO numbers will vary depending on your picture profile, but it's 640 and 4000 in V-Log for the S5. The camera also comes equipped with 5-axis internal body image stabilization, and the camera can be charged and provide continuous power through its USB-C port. Now here's a way in which the S5 has been adapted to less demanding users. The 10-bit recordings are limited to 30 minutes, but 8-bit remains unlimited. The camera maxes out at 4K internal, as I previously mentioned, but it still gets its image from an oversampled 5.9K sensor, so you'll get a really, really nice 4K. The data transfer rates have been more than halved, which is better for the media conscious, but can limit the strength of your file. The IBIS is one stop less effective than the S1H, and they've swapped out the standard Type A HDMI for micro HDMI, likely due to the body size. In my mind, none of these are really deal breakers. We're already kind of used to this type of feature set, but what's great to see is how 10-bit 422 is kind of becoming the standard now, and it makes these small cameras even more powerful and even easier to work with. So now you have all the facts, let's get into everyone's favorite part, my opinion, my top likes and challenges for the S5. First up is the color science. For me, the S1H was a complete game changer in terms of color science. In my mind, this puts Panasonic mirrorless on par with Fujifilm in skin tones and color. The 10-bit V-Log is quick and easy to grade and provides a lovely filmic contrast and color. For the record, I love the new Sony a7S III. P.S. That video is coming. But when it comes to getting a great image out of log, I can get there so much faster with V-Log than I can with S-Log. This makes it a great camera for one-man band shooters who have to do a lot of their own post-production. Number two is their face tracking and autofocus. Now I have to give credit to Panasonic for really stepping up here. The autofocus on the GH5 was laughably bad in my opinion. And the S5 takes a big leap putting its accuracy on par with, once again, Fujifilm, but not quite as reliable as Sony or Canon. Now a few small critiques. While the camera does an incredible job at recognizing faces and bodies and eyes, better than Sony even, its focus doesn't always play along. Additionally, there are no real autofocus fine-tune settings. No way to adjust the responsiveness and the speed of the autofocus. Even on fast, it takes longer to react than I would prefer, or than I'm used to with Sony or Canon. Number three is the size and design. The camera feels impeccably designed. Nothing feels awkward, and the weather-resistant magnesium build is rock solid. Additionally, it's smaller and lighter than a GH5, and doesn't have what I always felt was an antiquated, bulbous design. There is no feeling that you are getting an inferior camera in any way. The menu is beautifully laid out, and I was never bereft for finding what I was looking for. And lastly, we're going to touch upon some photo features. To hit a home run in this product category, you also need to deliver great still images. Stripping this camera of any video features, and you'd still be left with a solid stills camera. The 24 megapixel image tonality is excellent, and the Leica glass provides some incredible image fidelity. If I was to provide any criticism, it's that while the math on their high resolution 95 megapixel still feature adds up, the visual results don't. Testing this a variety of ways, I just simply don't see that much of a difference. Certainly not four times the resolution. If you were to quickly glance at this camera, you might think it's just a throttled S1H and assume that it is in some way inferior. 
I'd argue against that in saying that most hybrid or high amateur users don't require much of what makes the S1H cost north of five grand Canadian. S5 users get a workhorse camera with an impeccable and approachable color science. Now the time of this recording, I can honestly say that I cannot think of another full frame camera that can do what the S5 can do for the price. And it's also worth mentioning that Panasonic says they have no intention of getting rid of their GH line. In fact, because there's still a want, a need, and an intent to continue to develop their Micro Four Thirds line, at least for now. But for full frame users, you finally have an entry into Panasonic's Pro Color Science at a fraction of the cost of the S1H, and that is super exciting. And that's it, guys. Thanks so much for watching. As always, please subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. And as I always say, go out there, have fun, and happy shooting. Bye.